On today's episode of The Setup, I want to talk about how to build arrows. And the bigger question really might be, why do I want to build my own arrows? Because when I first started uh, building arrows, it was in the late 80s. Um, and I did it because I saved money doing it. It was cheaper to make my own arrows than it was to buy arrows from the manufacturer. So I did it purely to save a few dollars a dozen on my arrows. But now that's kind of gone away because to buy all the tools that you need and um, you know find access to a cutoff saw, it, it takes a lot of extra effort to build your own arrows. And you really don't save that much money doing it, if any. In fact, it might be just a wash as far as you know how much it costs you to buy the components and then build it as it does just to buy the, the finished arrow from the manufacturer. But what you do get to do when you build your own arrows is control all the variables. Like if you look right here, I've got two different arrows that I built this morning and uh, you know, two different styles. The, they're gonna shoot slightly differently probably uh, from the bow. That's what I've learned is that you know, the, the stiffer, high profile, short fletching flies a little bit different than the longer, more flexible uh, style of fletching. And sometimes you, you find that your bow tunes better with one versus the other. You control uh, all the variables, the straightness uh, of, of the components, um, you know, how much helical you put on the veins. You can experiment with different things. You can find the perfect formula for your shooting and your bow. I don't know too many really serious archers that don't make their own arrows just from that standpoint. Uh, nothing wrong with buying them, but there's, there's a definite benefit uh, to, to making your own arrows. So let's dive into it. It's really easy. Um, I think it's probably going to shock you how easy this really is. Uh, you need, obviously, the bear shafts. And then you need some type of a fletching jig. This is just a piece that I've owned forever. Uh, in fact, it's got cobwebs on it. <laughs> this was a Martin uh, jig. This is a Bitsenberger uh, clamp. And the Bitsenberger is kind of the, I would say, the Rolls-Royce name in, in uh, arrow fletching products. But, uh, you know, you, there's no reason that you have to get the absolute best on this. But also you don't want to get the cheap stuff because it does have to be accurate. You know, how you index the arrow around to put the next fletching on has to be accurate. How it holds the clamp in place, you know, that all has to be done, you know, very well and very accurately. So you don't want to get some cheap stuff either. So let's start with that. We got a, an arrow. It's got the knock in it, and the bottom of this uh, fletching jig has a receptacle that's slotted that the, that the knock goes down into. So that's how you start. You slide it into that slot. See now I can't turn it. So if I want to index it from one spot to the next to put the next vein in, I just turn this. You hear it click into the next detent. So I'm going to start with uh, oh. It doesn't really matter like the colors and that sort of thing. I like to, to shoot bright fletchings. Um, there's no real good reason for that. You can kind of see them when they're flying a little bit better. But, uh, you know, other than that, it's more personal preference than anything. So I'm going to put a white one on. Uh, I try to put my fletchings so that they're, you can see about how, how far forward from the knock they are. And I've done that by trial and error um, because I, I want to make sure that at full draw that I've got plenty of clearance between the string, the bow string, and the vein, and also between my face. You know, I don't want it right up against my face because then you've got contact between the vein and your face. So when you're at full draw, you know, that you want it to be just a little ways from the, the knock into the arrow. So for me, I'm looking at this thing and it's got some index marks on the clamp. Um, I mean, you just have to, like I said, trial and error. You'll figure it out for yourself. But I've got one that I always use every time. So I just put the vein in the clamp. Uh, this is a little pin that I got from Easton. It's called the vein primer pin. And uh, you can fill it with acetone. And you just kind of push down on it, and it releases it. And then you can wipe it across the vein. And that removes any uh, oils or any chemicals that might be left over on the vein from the manufacturing process. Um, first thing I did with all of these arrows, I didn't mention it yet, but I wash them, the, the uh, back end of the arrow really well with like a dish soap and hot water, then dry them off really well. And that takes, again, 
uh, takes away all of the chemicals that might have been left over from the manufacturing process. You, you need to get it so that your, your uh, glue is going to adhere to it really well. So I'm just using super glue. Nothing special about that. You know, I've tried a bunch of different ones. This is Loctite Super Glue Liquid. And I like it because um, it goes on real smooth and I can see it on the vein. I can look at it and go, okay, I've got nice full coverage because you can see it shining on there. Um, you don't want to have any gaps. Now when you put the clamp onto the, the jig, you want to position it, let it snap into place with the magnet before you push down on it. Because if you push it against the arrow first and then snap it over to the magnet, you're going to get all different kinds of alignment. Again, consistency is the key. So I snapped it into the magnet. Uh, now I slid the clamp down onto the arrow and I'm holding pressure against the arrow uh, between the clamp and the arrow. And I do that for about 20 seconds with each vein. That gives that super glue time to, to make a grab and, and uh, eliminate any air pockets that might form between the vein and the shaft. So that's about my 20 seconds. Now I, I open the clamp take the clamp off, and I don't turn this now to index it because as you can see, my vein is right, you know, pressed up against that magnet. There's a tendency if you would do that maybe to, if the vein hasn't completely locked up yet with the super glue, uh, you might knock it off. So I just take the arrow out, index the, the uh, jig, put the arrow back in again, and then move on to the next vein. You know, we could fast forward from now on because it's all repetition. Um, you know, I just take the next one. Again, I run my acetone on there. And you could use anything to put acetone on. You don't need this little pen. You can use just a little cotton swab or something like that. It evaporates really fast though. So you want to make sure that uh, you, know, you, you re-wet whatever you're using every single time. So let's talk about how much glue to put on. Don't overdo the glue because as you know with super glue, if you put a bunch on, it doesn't really grab that well. I'm not saying less is more because that doesn't work either. You just got to have a nice uh, smooth, if you want to call it that, or um, you know, thin line of glue. You don't know if you can see it, but there's just it's it's wet the whole way, but there's no globs. Again, I set it against the magnet, slide the clamp to the back side of the of the jig, and then I push it down until the fletching is solid against the shaft. Hold it there for 20 seconds. Uh, while I'm holding it, let's talk about fletching alignment. The, the, there's two different ways you can go. You can either go with helical or you can go with straight. And you can do straight offset. Um, it all comes down to what clamp you use. This clamp that I have is a right helical, which doesn't really mean that much. It just says which direction it spins the arrow left or right doesn't make a whole lot of difference when you're shooting a release aid. Um, I know the finger shooters used to have a preference, especially when they had, had the big feathers on the arrows. If it spun, you know, one way, you know, they felt like, I don't really think it makes a difference because I don't think the arrow starts spinning that quick. Um, I think it's still skidding through the air. If you look at the really slow motion photography that Easton has done over the years, the arrow doesn't really start spinning until it's out in front of the bow. It's just skidding you know, through the air trying to get a little bit of a purchase, you know, trying to get some traction in the air to get it to start spinning. Um, so whether it's left helical or right helical, that doesn't seem to matter from the standpoint of getting it out of the bow without hitting the rest. Now, okay, I've got two, oops, I've got two of them on and uh, I just indexed it. I'm gonna do the third one, uh, same process. So now while I'm waiting for this one to to set, we'll talk about coloration of the veins. And uh, when you put the arrow on the bow, you're going to align it the same way each time because that's part of the tuning process is rotating the knock of the arrow, which changes how the fletchings go through the rest or around the rest or over the rest. Um, once you get the bow tuned, you want to be able to put the arrows into the bow the same way every single time. So you want to be able to have an indicator vein. It's the one that's the opposite color of the other two. That's the one that's going to be the one on the arrow that will tell you how to put the arrow into the bow. 
Uh, I know that sounded kind of awkward, but you have to have some way of knowing that the arrow has to be placed a certain way, rotated a certain way, so that the fletchings go through or around the rest correctly without hitting them, without hitting the rest. Um, so let me see, I got this one in place. So now I've got a white and two yellows. So let's say that by the time I get this thing tuned and tweaked in, I find that it fits or, or tunes the best if one of the veins is pointed straight down. If that's the case, then I want to say, okay, how do I get it like that? Because you know, you're going to have your knock rotated. Now you're snapped onto the bowstring like this, you know, one vein pointed straight down. But if you've put it on the other way, now you've got one vein pointed straight up. So you can't just randomly have, you know, an arrow with three identical veins. Um, that off-colored one is one that you look at and say, okay, I'm going to have the off-colored one to the left or the off-colored one is going to be, you know, straight up or whatever it's going to be. That's the one that every time you knock an arrow that tells you whether it's this way or this way because you've got two options you know, when you snap it onto the string. Uh, you could do all three the same color and then just come back with like a Sharpie or something to make a mark. You know, I've done that before too. We just look down and say, okay, that one's got a little red mark on it. That's the one that goes up. Um, but whatever you do, you have to have one that's the indicator because you want to have consistency with how you knock your arrows so that they all travel through the bow exactly the same way. So I've just built an arrow. Um, not 100% built because we still have to do something with this end. Um, and we'll do that next. But uh, I've, I've looked at or I've created one option for you. This is the, you know, putting the short, stiff veins directly onto the shaft. Now we're going to look at uh, a, a different option. And that's going to be using a, uh, a wrap and then using some of these softer you know, a little bit longer uh, veins that I got. So I'm building uh, Jordan's arrows right now. These are the day six arrows and uh, she's shooting the 500, which is a really a, a fairly flexible shaft, but she's shooting about 40 pounds. So arrow stiffness is based on two things, the length of the arrow and then the weight, the draw weight of your bow. So the higher the draw weight, the stiffer the arrow has to be, and the longer the arrow, the stiffer it has to be. Just the, the physics of, you know, when you load a column, you know, how much does it flex? Well, the longer it is, if you put the same amount of force, it's going to bow more. Um, so as you get shorter, it gets stiffer naturally. So we, we she's shooting a fairly short arrow, um, so we're going to go with the 500, which is not a, a super um, stiff arrow, but it's about 8.2 grains per inch. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll add it up when we get done. I think she's about probably 27, 26 inch arrow length. Um, so I'll do the, the math here in just a second and see what that shaft weighs. Uh, I like for a finished arrow for whitetail hunting to be somewhere around five to six uh, grains per pound of maximum draw force. So if she's shooting 40 pounds, to have a 240, 250 grain finished arrow would be pretty good. My guess is she's going to be heavier than that. But as the, the draw weight starts to go up, it becomes uh, easier and easier to get back into that range uh, because you know, the, the arrow weights uh, tend not to grow too much per inch, even as the draw weights go up. So uh, let's talk about uh, putting a wrap on a shaft and uh, kind of go through that process. Again, you have a lot of options. I mean, I'm not a big wrap guy, but we've got some here. They're pretty cool. Um, I just want to show you what options are available. Um, the reason I don't use them is just, just from a purely simplicity standpoint. This is an arrow with a wrap installed on it. And it took me a little while to get the wrap on there straight. Um, now let's say I want to one of these veins gets damaged and I want to replace it. With a, an unwrapped arrow, all I do is take a knife and scrape all the old glue off, put this back into the fixture, index it correctly, and then put another vein in that spot. But with the wrapped ones, you know, by the time you scrape the glue off, you've scraped the wrap off. Now you're kind of stuck trying to figure out, okay, do I glue another one on there with no wrap in that spot or do I replace the wrap? It's kind of a nuisance, really. They're cool, no doubt but 
I'm just not a rap guy. So let's go to how we would do those. I've got a few packages of them here. They're really simple. They're just decals, basically. Uh, probably some kind of vinyl or something, I'm guessing. But uh, you just peel them off. You're going to lay it down on the table in such a way that I can roll the arrow. The knock is a larger diameter than the arrow itself, so I'm going to take that off so I can roll that wrap onto the shaft without that knock causing a problem. The trick now is to line it up square. So I go to the end of the arrow with the end of the wrap, try to line the edge of the wrap up with the arrow, and then start rolling. Um, And it doesn't always work just to roll it off the table. Usually it works a little bit better to roll it by hand as it goes around. You just press it down with your finger and you get a nice solid bond between the arrow and the decal. Um, okay. So now you can see I've got the wrap on there and it's self-adhesive. And, you know, it's cool. Day six, uh, specialized gear, it's right there. Um, you know, I smooth it out, use a little friction, heat it up with my fingers as I'm kind of smoothing it down to make sure that everything is stuck together good. So now I've got the, the knock back on the arrow, and uh, this is ready to fletch. And when I was younger, we painted. I didn't. People would paint them. They call it cresting. They would dip an arrow in paint pull it out and then they'd fletch over the top of that. Uh, they felt like they were more visible, like they were maybe easier to find in the weeds if they missed the deer. See, I don't see when it's flying away from me that the wrap is going to make that much difference in visibility of the arrow in the air. Maybe if your angle, I don't know, maybe you can see it a little bit better. I don't feel like that's the, the key to it. I feel like they're easier to find after you shoot them and they are cooler. Like when you're looking down at your quiver full of arrows, it is pretty cool to see them all customized and, and uh, wrapped up. But I never felt like they served a huge practical purpose. They would just add one more step and kind of complicate the building process. Uh, so I was never a, a, a big advocate of wraps. But we're going to put the day six veins on this one. And again, these are slightly longer, uh, more pliable vein than what I put on that first arrow. The first arrow was, these were some veins from Easton and they're real stiff, short and very stiff. And the reason you might like a stiff vein is if you watch again the slow motion uh, videography, you'll see the, the veins flap almost like the, the wings of a bird when the arrow's going forward trying to stabilize the arrow. And the stiffer it is, the less they're gonna flap around and the more initial stability you're gonna get from the arrow. Uh, and also, I like them a little bit shorter because, in my experience, they go through those dropaway rests a little bit easier because, they'll, obviously, the longer the fletching is, you know, the, re the rest has to be out of the way longer. So the shorter it is at the back of the arrow, you know, it just gives you, you know, a little bit more time for that clearance to occur and the arrow to zip through. Uh, stability in flight was always a huge thing with fletching uh, back in the early days because everybody was shooting these big fixed blade broadheads, half of which weren't very well made, they weren't straight. So we shot big five inch veins, you know, sometimes five inch feathers. And um, now these are, I'm guessing these are about two inches, maybe the ones that, uh, that uh, day six makes. And then these Easton ones, I think are probably about maybe inch and a half, roughly thereabouts. So the veins have gotten a lot shorter. And uh, like I said, from a tuning standpoint, that's a little bit easier. But from a stability standpoint, that can cause problems because you still have, you know, the, the vein is still the rudder of the ship. So you don't want that thing to get too small. With mechanical broadheads, you can get away with a little bit less uh, stabilizing on the back end because the front end, front end of the arrow isn't trying to, you know, turn the arrow right away coming out of the bow. But, you know, a good compromise, like I said, are these, these two inch, roughly two inches that uh, uh, Day 6 makes. So let's throw some of those on. And uh, we'll put these on, and then uh, we'll talk about how to cut the arrow and uh, get it the right length. That's the final step. Okay, again, removing all the chemicals from the manufacturing process. 
with the acetone, thin band of super glue, full length. Just look for it to shine. Set it against the magnet, slide it down onto the arrow. And you might be wondering how much uh, helical offset that I use on my arrows. I use the most that I can and still get good adhesion between the fletching and the shaft. You know, if you go, if you offset the front of the clamp too much, then the, the arrow's base doesn't sit square against the shaft and you don't get a good glue bond there. Uh, so it's probably three degrees, four degrees, I'm guessing. Uh, a lot of manufactured arrows are about two degrees of helical offset. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I like more because, you know, I just want to spin the arrow faster. Um, and I'm sure there's been studies done and my approach probably isn't the best one, but I've always felt like the faster I spin the arrow and the quicker I get the arrow spinning, the uh, more stable it's going to be going through the air, especially in the old days with those big old clunky broadheads that weren't particularly aerodynamic to begin with. Uh, sort of like a football. If you're going to throw a football straight, you can't knuckleball it and have the arrow or the football trying to fly through the air. You know, you have to spin it. And the faster you spin it, the more stable that thing is when it's uh, flying through the air. So it's the same thing with an arrow. Um, the downside, I think the trade-off with that is going to be maybe a, you lose a little bit of arrow speed um, when you're dragging that much, but more importantly, you probably are making the arrow a little bit louder when it's flying through the air, when you've got a lot of helical, uh, a lot of offset. And I don't really know, to be honest with you, if that plays a big role or not. Uh, some people feel like the deer hear the arrow coming. Um, I feel like the deer hear the bow go off way, way more then they hear the arrow coming through the air. So if you're talking about string jumping, um, does the, the sound that the arrow make going through the air make a difference? I don't know, I'm not convinced that it does, but I could be wrong about that too. I just shot an awful lot of deer and, and uh, it seems like it's so, I won't say random when they drop and how much they drop, but I surely couldn't pin it down to what type, what type of fletching I've got on my arrows. Uh, let's see, let's get this one in place. And then we got one more to put, put on. And then uh, we'll start cutting these off. So let's talk about these arrows a little bit more. This is the, like I said, these are the day six arrows. We started shooting them this year. Uh, they're really rugged and well-made, very straight, small diameter arrows. I like a small diameter arrow. I feel like it really uh, improves penetration because you know, you've just got less uh, resistance because you've got less material that you're pushing through the whatever target you're shooting into, whether it be a deer or, or anything else. The less surface area you have, the less drag you have you know, going through that media. Uh, so I like smaller diameter. I also feel like you know, crosswind a smaller diameter arrow is to be preferred because it doesn't have as much surface area for the wind to push against. That's another reason why I like the smaller veins too because you know on a crosswind you're just not going to get that much uh, sideways push you know from the wind itself. Uh, let's get some more glue down here. We're almost done with this arrow. And again like, like you see this process is pretty simple. Um, but the reason you do it is because of all the options. You know, there's, there's so many different ways you can fletch arrows. I mean, the, the degree of helical offset, uh, straight versus helical, uh, how many veins you put on the arrow. You know, some people like to do four fletch. Uh, I know that there have been some experts that have come out and, and said that four fletch is the most accurate. Uh, my vein or my uh, jig isn't set up for it, so I've never tried four fletch myself. I guess I feel like these arrows will hit wherever I point the bow. If they're not hitting the right spot, it's probably not the arrow's fault. Uh, once I get these things well made, it's my fault. Okay, so there's arrow number two. 
in our process. And this is one that's cool. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, that's a good looking arrow. It's, uh, it's got the wrap. It's a day six wrap, uh, the day six veins. And, uh, you know, it's just a sharp looking arrow. It's, I think, you know, sitting on the retail shelf, you're probably going to say that one's, that's the one I want. Um, and I'm just the, the minimalist. I mean, I go with something that's just as simple as I possibly can get it. So this is what I shoot here. So we've got two different setups for Jordan now. Um, let's go out and uh, uh, I'll show you how to cut those off to the right length. In the cutoff part, um, don't skimp on that. You know, there's, you might think, oh, I can use a hacksaw or I can, you know, use a Dremel tool or whatever, but you just don't get a square cut. And it's so critical to get a square cut because um, when you put your insert, or in this case, the outsert, you know, it butts against the end of the arrow. That's going to have some effect if there's any amount of, of uh, you know, loose tolerance at all between, you know, the, the insert or outsert and the arrow itself, then it's going to want to take the, the direction of the end of the arrow. If the end of the arrow is not square to the arrow, you're going to have your insert or your outsert pointed just slightly in the wrong direction. Um, and even a fraction of a degree of, of uh, misalignment between the broadhead and the shaft is going to translate into an arrow that wants to turn and veer. So this is where it's super critical. And again, one of the reasons why I build my own arrows, because I can control all these little bitty things that add up to accuracy. The final step is to cut these arrows off to the correct length. But I want to show you something that's pretty cool about these uh, the day six outserts. Generally, when you buy an outsert, it's already been machined. You got one solid piece. It's going to weigh whatever this thing weighs. Um, but day six makes them as components. So I can actually unscrew the part that goes inside the shaft from the part that goes outside. So this could be aluminum or this could be steel. This piece that goes outside the shaft could be aluminum or steel, depending upon how much weight you want on the front of your arrow. We could spend a bunch of time talking about balance points on arrows, but that's one way that you can change the balance point of your arrow by putting steel uh, at the front of it. I mean, you could get a, a heavier broadhead, a uh, lighter broadhead, whatever, or like uh, day six permits here, you can just change um, what the outsert and the por portion that goes inside the shaft are made of. Uh, we're going lightweight because Jordan's only drawn 40 pounds. So we're, we're aluminum and aluminum. Um, I thought that was a pretty cool feature that they offer. So when you get done, it's going to be epoxied right onto the end of the arrow like this. But you got to figure out where to cut it off first. So one of the steps that we're going to take right now is we're going to determine how far the shaft goes into the outsert. And that's going to tell us when we get the arrow on the bow and Jordan draws it back, and we make our mark. That's going to tell us how much more arrow to add to that um, when we cut it off. I'm just going to make a mark right where the outsert joins the shaft. Just right at the end there. Now when I slide this thing off, I can measure how far back that mark is from the end. And in this case, it is roughly three quarters of an inch. Uh, slightly less than that. I guess it'd be five eighths of an inch. But three quarters will work just fine. So when we cut this thing off, first thing we're gonna do is have Jordan draw it back. I'm gonna make a mark on the shaft about a quarter to a half inch in front of the rest. And then we'll add that three quarters of an inch to that mark, and that's where we'll cut the arrow off at. That way when we glue the insert on, or the outsert, uh, it's gonna slide onto the shaft the correct length, and we're gonna have just a small little overlap in front of the rest before it comes to the outsert. So let's do that next. This is the mark that I made when Jordan drew the bow. And like I mentioned, when we were inside at the table, I've got to add roughly three quarters of an inch to that 
to get the final cutoff length for this arrow. So now I'm setting that against there. I got my Sharpie. All right. So there's my final cutoff length, and I can check that. I brought an outsert with me. Well, I can't check it until I cut it, I guess, unfortunately. But I don't need to cut more than one before I check that. But that should be, when I slide this all the way in, this should be just in front of that outsert. So now let's talk about the cutoff saw itself. And uh, these, uh, they're kind of expensive, but they're the real key to doing this arrow building process effectively. Like I said, you've got to have a square cut. And if you buy your shafts from the dealer, more than likely he'll cut them off for you. You know, once you, know, once you determine exactly what length you need them. But if you buy the, the arrows online, you know, you go into the dealer, he's going to be less apt to do that for you. He may do it for a fee, which is still cheaper, of course, than buying one of these. Or if you've got three or four or five buddies or an archery club or whatever, someplace where you shoot, maybe the whole group of you can invest in one of these cutoff saws. And then whenever somebody needs it, you know, they can uh, just pop out there and use it. Because you really only make three, four dozen arrows at the most a year. I mean, how much do you really need one of these things? So it's a pretty big investment if you're just going to buy one to make a couple dozen arrows a year. So it's better to go in with somebody. But they're really, they're really uh, a cool setup. So now I can put the arrow in here. I can see the mark. My cutoff mark is right there. I loosen this and I slide this part until that lines up with the little cutoff wheel. Okay, so right there, roughly. So now my mark, my cutoff mark, is lined up with the cutoff wheel. Looks like I gotta go a little bit further. Now, once I tighten this part into place, every arrow I do after that, all I gotta do is snap it in there and turn it and, and cut it right off. So now, just turn the motor on. And then just turn the arrow against that cutoff, that little cutoff wheel. Sounds like an airplane taking off, but. Um, so now the arrow, uh, cut it off at the maximum cutoff length. We're gonna slide the outsert on there. And you can see that it slides right down to line up with the mark we made when Jordan was at full draw. So this thing will stick just a quarter of an inch to a half an inch in front of her rest at full draw, right where we want it. And uh, you know the final process of epoxying this piece onto the shaft is pretty straightforward. It's a two-part epoxy mix. It comes with the outsert when you buy it. You mix them together. I just you know, uh, stir a little bit with the end of the outsert and get a glob of epoxy on there, start it into the shaft, and then just turn it you know, as I'm feeding it in. And that distributes it you know, the whole way on the portion that goes inside the shaft and the part that goes on the outside. So you get a really solid bond. So after that, you're completely finished. You've got a custom-made arrow that you control all the variables. Uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's probably easier and cheaper uh, to buy them ready-made, but it's nice to make them yourself, to control those variables, to be able to experiment, and also you have the satisfaction of killing stuff, you know, with an arrow that you made yourself, which is pretty cool. So I'm looking forward to seeing Jordan uh, shoot this thing uh, through a deer here in the next couple of days.